Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, I should say. Uh, this is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And uh, I've really been looking forward to doing this one for a while. Um, one of my very favorite writers, Kathleen Kent, uh, is joining our little program tonight to discuss her killer new book, The Pledge, which is the third, and we won't say final, <laughs> although they're marketing it as a trilogy. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, okay. And the Betty Rizik. Rizik, is that? That's, it's Betty Rizik. That's all right. Rizik. Rizik. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Series, uh, which started with um, the dime and the burn, and has, has again continued with this third in the series. Um, welcome, Kathleen. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Patrick. I, I love the Poison Pen Bookstore, and I'm I'm thrilled to be invited virtually. If I can't be there in person, I'm thrilled to be there. Yeah. Over the ether. Absolutely. I, I can't wait until we have you back out here live in person again. We've done some fun events here in the past, haven't we? We have. And I think the last time I was there was with Joe Lansdale, I think, yeah. right? Which was, he's one of my favorites, a good, a good friend now. And uh, yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. So hopefully we can do that again in the near future. Two quintessentially Texas authors together. Yeah. And both from East Texas as well. We have, we have a lot, we found out that we had a, a lot in common growing up behind the pine curtain. And so, yeah. uh, so he's from Nacogdoches, right? Right. That's right. Where are you from? Well, I, I grew up in Dallas, but I spent many summers with my grandparents in Kilgore, which is, you know, the East Texas, uh, close to Longview, and um, spent a lot of time visiting relatives in, uh, in Louisiana. So th there's, you know, Texas is such a big state, and it's so varied that um, you really can't encompass it by saying we're, we're all the same because people that grew up in East Texas are very different than those that grew up in West Texas. Uh, you know, the, the stories are different, the cuisine is different, the accents are different. So um, it always feels like a homecoming when I talk to Joe because he has that particular, that great twang that East Texans have. And uh, so we, we have a lot, we have a lot to talk about when we get together. I'll bet. Yeah, and the uh, the topography is so vastly different. You know, the you know the you're more into the piney, and then getting into the swamp country in the right. in Louisiana, um, and then you know, as you know, just a the Llano Estacado, and the, the whole Texas is so vast and right. settled by different groups too, right? I mean, it's right. not. Absolutely, and I I think that's why Texas is such a rich. Uh, fertile ground for writing crime, for writing mystery, um, because because you have this great diversity, um, and you know the the past Texas was built uh, on a very violent past, and so that that kind of leaches through the generations, and that was one of the main reasons that I set the Detective Betty series in Texas was because, you know, the, when you think of classic crime, you think of it set in New York or Chicago, Boston, LA, there's, there's a long, you know, decades worth of wonderful uh, crime series that are set there. And, and you do have crime in, set in Texas, but I, but I specifically wanted to set it in Dallas because I think people are surprised when they hear about Dallas having the exact same problems um, that, that Boston or New York have. I mean, we're a very pretty city. We've got lots of money, but we have drugs. We have prostitution. We've got sex trafficking. We've got all of the vices. Uh, our lawns are just prettier though. <laughs> we do a good job, we do a good job of, of hiding it. So I, um, so I purposefully said it in Dallas to kind of to show that contrast between what's the wealthy, pretty parts and the not so pretty parts. Right, right. And the whole DFW area is really underrepresented, I think, in, in, uh, in crime fiction. There's bits and pieces here and there, but uh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, you know, funny as as a way of kind of easing our way into a conversation, 
I really, you know, you started out your literary career with these three just exquisitely done historical novels. Um, the was it the Heretic's Daughter that was the first published yeah. book? That was my first book published. Yeah. yeah. And where? When was that? 2010, 2009, something like that. Uh, it was published in 2008. Okay. And um, that was uh, so. I'd spent 20 years living and working in New York doing, working in various commercial enterprises. I worked for the Commodity Exchange, and then I worked as a contractor for the Department of Defense in Russia. So the only writing that I did was contract writing for the DOD. And they, they, they don't like creative writing. They just, they just want the facts, ma'am. Right. Um, but I had gone to UT at Austin wanting to be um, a, a writer, a novelist, but it, I just took the long way, the long way home. It was 20 plus years um, before I, before I really uh, took the plunge and I moved to New York and uh, from New York to Dallas in 2000 and spent about five or six years working on this first novel, which was The Heretic's Daughter. And it's based in part on um, uh, my nine times great grandmother who was hanged as a witch in Salem. I had no contacts in publishing at all. I, I didn't know where to start. I got, you know, the writer's market place and started sending out to, to agents. Um, and I was able to get an agent and she got my first deal with Little Brown. And I've been with Little Brown I'm a, on my seventh book. And I've been with Little Brown Mulholland since 2008. So I, I felt very fortunate to have their support and to allow me to, to, to shift, to change genres the right. way I did, because the three works of historical fiction are, are very different and not just subject matter, but in pacing and in, it, you know, they're very classic historical works of fiction. And this allowed me, the crime series allowed me to kind of stretch my writing muscles in different directions. And it, and it was really, it was a lot of fun. It was really great. Well, you know, it's funny, I love, um... The second one was called The Traitor's Wife, right? Right, And then right. the third, which is, I must confess, is my favorite, is The Outcasts. Uh, I look at that as in a lineage with Betty's world in a way, you know, because it's a Texas, historical Texas story. Right. And uh, there are glimpses throughout, we'll get into this, but there are glim glimpses throughout the Betty books of the old Texas. Right. Know? And uh, right. I love that about the books. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I love The Outcast. And, you know, I had planned to do a sequel to set it. Oh, really? Because The Outcast is set, is set in 1870. And I was going to set the sequel in 1880, where you have all of the iconic, you know, the Bat Mastersons and, you know, the all, all of the great uh, iconic gunfighters of the West and kind of give some of my characters who who uh who needed to be redeemed to give them some redemption down down the road uh but you know it, life took me in a different direction but hopefully i can someday revisit that story yeah that'd be and great. carry it forward love it yeah and the whole you know it's for many many years the comanches didn't get the press that the uh you know the sioux <laughs> or some of the other tribes got Right. And, you know, a couple of uh, the uh, the Empire of the Summer Moon and some other, right. you know, uh, histories have really brought, un, you know, long overdue attention to the story of the Comanches. And, right. And, um, right. you know, but we won't get into that too much, but I love that <laughs> stuff too. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, but yeah, I wanted to make, just ask you about making that transition to, uh, to crime fiction and um, was there a through line as far as the tone? I've asked authors this before, you know, who, who've done different, different genres. Uh, and some people say, you know, my voice is my voice. And, uh, and others say, you know, I, I really like the challenge of adopting a slightly different tone mm -hmm. um, to it. Uh, I was interested, and I, I know you've told me this before, but that Betty has her roots in a, sh a work of short fiction that you did. Right. Uh, for the Dallas Noir. Can you talk about that? Right. I was, um, <clears throat> so The Outcast had been published and soon after I got a call from a friend who was, um, who was putting together an anthology 
of crime fiction set in Dallas. It was called Dallas Noir by Akashic Publishers. And they've done, I don't know, maybe at this point, 200 different anthologies set in different places in, in the US and internationally. And um, he said, I really like your writing. And I'm, I, uh, I'm calling to see if you have any contemporary crime uh, short stories that you could submit. Um, and of course, being the good fiction writer that I am, I lied and said, yeah, I think I probably have of something. Of course I do. Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> How much time do I have? And he said, oh, a couple of weeks. So I, I got off the call with him and I immediately called a cousin of mine that I'm very close to, who uh, he's retired now, but he was in the police department. He's worked uh, undercover uh, as a, a vice undercover, narcotics undercover. He worked for SWAT. You know, he was the officer in charge for SWAT for a while in Plano. So I knew that he had probably had a lot of great stories. So I took him to lunch and I said, tell me your worst. I mean, tell me, you know, give me some, some ideas for stories. And he did, he gave me some great ideas. I wrote the short story, which was titled uh, Coincidences Can Kill You. And it was published in Dallas Noir. And the, uh, the publisher at Mulholland said, you know, I think there's something here. I, I, this, is, this is really unique. It's very different. First of all, it's a female protagonist. Yeah. But she's kind of an odd, um, she doesn't fit into the lethal but attractive, you know, PI or cop uh, that most people write about. And um, so we said, let's, let's run with this. So you see what you can come up with. And that's, you know, I wrote the dime. Um, and it, it was, you know, moving from New York back to Texas after being away for 20 years, I really felt it, it, it was an odd sensation because so much of it was familiar and yet I felt like an outsider. So I kind of channeled that into, uh, into the character of Betty Rizek. She's, um, she's from a family of Brooklyn cops. Her father was a cop, her brother, her uncle. Um, and there's some police corruption that Shocking. We, right, that weaves its way through, right, right. <laughs> uh, but her uncle Benny was her um, guiding light. Um, and he plays a significant part in all three books, even after his death. He speaks to her and gives her imparts his wisdom. Um, so, and also, you know, almost all of my female protagonists fall outside of the margins of what is considered acceptable for women. Absolutely. You know, yep. I wrote in The Heretic's Daughter, Martha Carrier is accused of being a witch, not because she does magic, but because she was very sharp-tongued, very vocal. And um, Lucinda in The Outcasts is a prostitute who, was a, who has epilepsy. She was abandoned at an early age by her father um, into an institution and suffered all kinds of indignities. Um, so I like giving my characters a lot of headwind from the very beginning. So Betty is, she's from Brooklyn. She moves to Texas. So she's a damn Yankee. She's close to six feet tall. She's got red hair. She's a lesbian and she's working for the Dallas Police Department. So I, I, she started off with a lot of, a lot of marks in the red column. <laughs> um, so, but I think that that's what makes for really interesting characters is they, they have, it's the demons that they have to fight not only externally, but their own demons internally as well. So that, that kind of gave lift to the character of Betty. It's interesting because in the, in the background, you know, uh, you don't, it, it's a really ingenious way that you do this. You don't really, you don't beat the reader over the head with anything. You know what I mean? There are all these different things going on. You just simply show us that, look, look, uh, people, women still go through a tremendous amount of shit, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. violence and challenges right. that, you know, maybe you all aren't aware of. Right. And I'm going to show you this. Right. And uh, I really admire that about the books. And there are so many 
I want to get into it. Even some of the minor characters I love, you know, like uh, like Dottie in the new book, the <laughs> owner of the, of the yeah. bar. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, we get there's... ahead of ourselves. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, let's just kind of pick up, uh, I hesitate to ask how much to get into with kind of a review of the dime and the burn. Is there kind of a, a short thing we can kind of get through to uh, orient the, the viewers and, and then we can get into the pledge in a little bit okay. more depth? Yeah, sure. I think, <clears throat> so the dime starts with Betty moving with her life partner, Jackie, to Dallas. And she's a stranger in a strange land. And the first book really is about her kind of learning twofold, learning to negotiate her way through the good old boys club. You know, uh, the Dallas Police Department, compared to the rest of the country, has a, a very small percentage of female police officers and officers of color. Now that's changing, but it's been changing very slowly. So, so she has to negotiate her way through uh, certain perceptions about what a woman's role will be in law enforcement. Um, and the other thing is that she very quickly inserts herself into uh, a very uh, bloody cartel, a homegrown cartel, which is also has cult-like uh, attributes to it in East Texas. And so she's fighting two battles in the dime. She's fighting the drug cartels and she's fighting for her place to be acknowledged um, for her strength and valor in the police force. So the dime then takes us into the burn where uh, the stakes are raised a little bit. Um, she, um, I really love the burn because it showed, I mean, she is a badass, you know, she's, she's tough. She's a force of nature, but she's also kind, you know, she gives money to the homeless. She takes in a pregnant girl off the streets and offers her shelter, uh, because she knows what it's like to be an outsider and she and Jackie, you know, there's some tension there. Jackie is a, is a doctor and she lives a fairly straightforward life and here her partner is this wild woman you know flaming red hair and amazon basically um which kind of and and then she her big battle is with a drug cartel enforcer named el cuchillo the knife who works for the sinaloa cartel but through the story, I also bring back this cult member, Evangeline Roy. Is she real? Is she not real? I kind of give glimmers of her. And then the pledge is the final. I bring them both together and Betty has to fight both of them. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do was all three books start with a flashback to an earlier time. In the dime, it's she's only been a cop for five months and she's immediately, you know, she's um, engages with a serial killer. In the second book, we get a glimpse into her brother whom she loved dearly, but who was crooked, who was a crooked cop and uh, paid a terrible price for that. So through the first two books, we get a lot of we, we see a lot of her interaction with the men in her family, her father, Benny, her brother. And I talk very little about her mother, but in the third book, and I start the first book with a, a quote from Medea, how does it feel with my teeth in your heart? And I, I wanted to explore more about her relationship with her mother and her, what does it mean to be a woman? What, what is that? What is that thing? Uh, can it be defined to include motherhood? Can it, can it be the exception to motherhood? What is nurturing? What is, you know, there are all these questions that I wanted answered and I, and I got a chance to exercise a lot of those through, you know, through the pledge. Well, the, um, boy, that, uh, the opening scene of the pledge, what a knockout from, uh, oh. And it, I, we're gonna we'll get into this, but you know the ghost of 9/11 shadows yeah, this, yeah. this book. Um, and I was gonna ask if were you still in uh, you were in New York at that time? I'm assuming. Um, <clears throat> so I moved to Texas in 2000, but I lived in Battery Park City, right in the shadow of the World Trade Center. 
we had business meetings there and I said I'd worked for you know the chairman of the commodity exchange and and when we had our um the um the DOD contracts we had our Christmas parties in windows of the world in the World Trade Center my son learned to walk in the atrium of five World Trade Centers so it was it was um a constant landmark the whole time I lived in New York and when I first moved to Battery Park City it was right after the explosion in the garage and you know in in and they had tried to blow up the World Trade Center and it right. failed, but they blew up part of the hotel. When I moved, I lived, I had a view to the hotel where the windows were still blown out. And I'll never forget the man that one of the men that moved me in looked at the view and he said, you know, this is probably the safest place in New York because lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Boy. And we, we moved in 2000 to Dallas, but I was watching the news on that morning. And it's, you know, even for people who didn't live in New York, it, it has a lasting impression. But for those of us who, who lived and worked and, and reveled in that landmark, it, it still is kind of a, a crippling uh, memory. And so I wanted to kind of play homage to that also that, you know, it it, it it seemed as though those buildings could never have been eradicated. And that's the folly of man, right? Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, it's timely, you know, that, of course, we're at the 20th anniversary right. of that this year. Right. Um, but the opening scene, which occurs, and again, since it is the opening scene, it's not too much of a spoiler, but it's a very important scene. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, about that scene and how you came to write it? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I uh, wanted to showcase a couple of things because I was looking at more of, of nurturing and motherhood and what does it mean to protect your children and how do we protect our children? The scene starts off uh, where she's called, she hears on the radio that there's been a murder in an apartment of a, of a couple, an older couple that she knows well. And the woman has um, apparently murdered her husband in a very brutal way. And as it turns out, you know, the woman killed her husband. She's on the ledge threatening to jump. Benny shows up and says, Betty, you know this woman, try to talk her in. Use, you know, let's not use force, just use your wits to bring this woman back into safety. Um, and, and she does, and she realizes that um, the, the woman was trying to defend and protect her grandchild from abuse. And this idea of sexual abuse is, um, is kind of a running pattern through it. And, and that's very pertinent. I mean, we, you know, we see this and it's been getting a lot of press and a lot of um, airing out. And I wanted to, I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to be able to, to showcase, um, you know, the effects of sexual abuse and what that does to, to generations of people. And ingeniously, you know, that the, the woman is covered in blood and she's out on the ledge you know, in, from all appearances, preparing to jump. And the other, you know, the other male cops are unable to, and she's in some state of shock, of course. Right. And um, uh, Betty is able to uh, say, all right, well, I'll, I can't remember exactly how you put it. Well, the woman says, Betty, why don't you just come with me? And we'll jump together. Right. right. And she says, um, okay, but can you make me something to eat first? Right. And that's the connection. Well, and and Ben afterwards, Benny, you know, he takes her to his favorite uh, cop bar, and they share a few Jamesons together. And he said, "That's your genius, Betty. You know instinctively how to connect with people in a way that they that they want to give you." you know, that, that they want to do for you, or you connect with them in a very deep way. And that, that plays through, through the book right up to the very end, that she, um, 
instinctively connects with people and, and what they really need or want from her without asking. Right. And so, of course, that's the day before September 11th. Right, and, and right. Where Benny says, you know, here's to September 10th. We're going to wake up tomorrow. The buildings will still be standing. We've got a <laughs> job to do. Everything's going to be fine. It'll be a brand new day. And then, of course, right. it is September the 11th. Right. And then cut to 2014. Um, right. And can you give us just a, a, a brief sketch of what's going on uh, in 2014 in this new book? Um, <clears throat> so uh, Betty, uh, Betty in the burn has rescued Mary Grace, a, a girl who's living on the streets, who's very pregnant. 17 year old, uh, huh? right? Yeah, she's 17. She's, she's a minor. And Jackie and uh, Betty take her into their home. She gives actually gives birth in their home. They, you know, she's living there for a couple of months with them. It seems that everything is is going well. And then one day, Mary Grace just ups and disappears and leaves the baby with them. And they don't know where she's gone. They don't know why she's left. Has she gone back to the streets? You know. And here's here. And Jackie is ready to take on she's a pediatric radiologist she deals with kids all day long she's ready to take on the baby you know who's been named elizabeth for for betty uh and betty's not so sure about this you know her life has been pretty good she can go out and you know drink with her colleagues or she and jackie can go out without it they have no pets they have no plants they're they work they work crazy hours they work crazy hours and all of a sudden there's this 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 tender vulnerable little baby that uh and that she that's not really sure she likes Betty to begin with and so <laughs> it's kind of she has to work her way through this and it speaks to you know children change your life uh your life irreparably you can't be selfish the way you can when you're single um and so but Again, in the pledge, uh, very early on in the book, she's contacted by El Cuchillo, by the knife, who's in Mexico, calls her and says, um, Evangeline Roy is back. She's in Texas. And you've got two weeks to find her. Otherwise, you're going to have to answer to me because she's my, uh, she's my competition. I want her taken out and I want you to do it. So then the clock starts ticking. There's a two-week period of time where Betty has to... Um, fend off the knife, but also track down uh, Evangeline Roy, who's very slippery. And along the way, people, people die as a result of, of Betty's missteps or her, uh, her hesitation in solving and going after some of these clues. Um, but, but, and again, as you said, there's some ancillary characters that I really, really love, like Johnny B., yeah. who's, uh, you know, who's uh, becomes a confidential informer. Wayne, a.k.a. Flush, is, makes a reprise. Um, and then well, and she, your, your PI, PI team. The PI team. Just wonderful. Right, right of, of Peg and Rocky Bentner. Rocky Bentner. Rocky Bentner is, she's, yeah, they are. They are um, and they're just, most of the characters that Betty is closest to are all outsiders. They kind of live on the periphery of, of polite society. And that's who she feels most comfortable with, but they get the job done, you know? Um, so I had a lot of fun writing this last book. And she's also, Betty's also a sergeant now. Um, yes, she's been made a sergeant. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And she has to, you know, she has some doubts about whether or not her team will accept her uh, for being sergeant because you know it changes the dynamics of, of the working relationship. And there's one cop who's a new, uh, a new addition to the team that she's a, a guy from Chicago right. that she has a real problem with. And um, uh, so there's a lot of friction there. Uh, so, I mean, she's, she's getting friction everywhere she turns. <laughs> It's wonder, nonstop. Yeah, you, you mentioned it. it's, all, of course, very important that she's from a, a police family, you know, as we've established. Um, but can you talk a little bit about 
getting some of those nuances straight, you know, talking about the tension within the, the different players within the police force, just getting the procedural details correct. Yeah. How do you go about doing that? That was probably the biggest challenge. You know, when you do research for historical fiction, if you go to an historian or a genealogical society, they're dying to talk to you because it's, you know, they, they wait, they wait for weeks at a time for somebody to knock on their door and say, right. tell me about agricultural practices in New England in the 17th century. You know, they uh, want to talk about it. A hundred other nerds around the country that might exactly. be. <laughs> exactly. Um, so doing research for this uh, police procedural, was, was problematic. I mean, I did have my cousin who, who was tremendous um, help and insight into how things work. Um, and I found, and of course, active duty police cannot talk to civilians. They're, they're, they're not allowed. But- That's right, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh no, they're, they're not allowed to talk about active uh, pending cases. As oh. long as they are active duty, I mean, it's a paramilitary, institution and they are not allowed and especially if you do detective work if you've got a detective's badge you cannot talk to a civilian um there are just too many issues of liability or or you know the cases that they're working on being compromised but i found quite a few police officers um and sheriff but people who worked in sheriff departments in texas who were retired and once they're retired, they can speak more openly. And they, they really uh, unfolded some fantastic cases. And I met a woman named Marilyn Hay, who was the first female detective that, that the city of Dallas had ever given a badge to. She uh, joined Police Academy in 1977. Three women started and she was the only one left standing. And what she went through, what they tried to do to get her to quit, really bordered on the criminal, you know, and, but she ended up being a 30 year veteran. Wow. And some of the stories, like the story in The Dime, where Betty um, is put in a chokehold by one of the, the physical fitness instructors and she knocks him into a wall and gives him a concussion. Well, that was a story that Marilyn told me. Really? That, that was based on a true story. So, um, so I just, I, I have so much admiration and I know, I know that, that police have come under scrutiny and rightfully so for, for malfeasance, for an excess of, of violence. And my cousin will be the first one, even though he's retired now, he'll be the first one to say, we need retraining. We need retraining. Um, but I, but I really admired, especially the women. I had talked to several other women who were longtime veterans, and their uh, their tenacity, their courage was was really remarkable. Wow, that's amazing. Um, well, we talked a little bit about the uh, about the. Let's get into the cartel stuff a little bit because. Okay. The, the violence, we all know and read about it, the violence is just broke in a lot of ways, you know, this incredible violence. Right. Um, and, you know, some of these main players, uh, you know, how they almost stage these execution scenes, especially south of the border, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable. I love Evangeline Roy, I don't know why, there's something uh, <laughs> very mysterious about her, uh, the sort of wraith-like quality Right. Um, right. Where did where did the inspiration for her and uh, El Cuchillo come from? Well, El, El Cuchillo. I mean, the the research that I did uh, on the cartels is is pretty well documented. Um, I mean, it's it's really horrific. If you look at you know like the FBI that looked into uh, the mafia. You know, when I lived when I lived in New York, Rudy Giuliani was a mayor for part of that time right. and he made his bones in law enforcement breaking the back of the cartels I mean of, of the mafia you know uh, through RICO charges and the FBI agents who worked those cases said that the Italian mafia as brutal as they were had a code they had rules about 
who was, you know, who would get the blunt end of the violence or not, you know, no women, no children, that type of thing, usually. Right. The cartels operate on a completely different level of carnage. You know, they, if, if you cross them, they're not just gonna kill you, they're gonna torture you. And it's done for effect. It's done to frighten anyone else out of, you know, cheating them or taking over their territory. Um, you know, and, and it's still going on until very recently, the Yucatan Peninsula was pretty much immune from the violence of the cartels you know, the Riviera Maya, Tulum, all those places, because they make so much money from the tourist industry. Lately, the cartels have edged their way in and there have been murders there of Western tourists. So it's, a, it's just, a, it's a really dangerous place. Um, and, but that's very well documented. Eventually, Roy, I mean, again, in East Texas, if you drive through, um, through East Texas, and you drive on these back roads, you'll see the remainders of, of uh, cars and tractors and trailers that have been burned out because meth labs have exploded. I mean, people are cooking meth in the trunk of their car. We were told uh, there's a lake just uh, east of here, Cedar Creek Lake, which is a very popular vacation spot for a lot of Dallasites. We were told uh, when I was doing the research for the book, that on the lake, if you see a boat that looks like it's on fire, don't approach them because they're cooking meth. <laughs> so it's, it, there's a whole culture. Now, interestingly, and perhaps sadly or tragically or inevitably, the cartels have taken over the meth business all through Texas, including East Texas. Um, it's cheaper, it's more powerful, and what they do is they, they, they'll, the cartels will move whole families into a little town and they'll become real estate agents, car salesmen. You know, they don't have the tattoos of, you know, the gang members. They're everyday citizens and they give it away for free and it's highly addictive. And then they have repeat business. So it's, it's pernicious. Um, it's evolving. Um, and so now an Evangeline Roy probably has been moved off the board. Now you're gonna have the cartel members there. But I love the idea, like you said, of having this kind of, um, this kind of weird, evil, you know, like evil- La Llorona or something like that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That she was very much a part, a homegrown East Texas which if you, if you know if you if you will and um i just i had fun creating her because she's uh you know she's so strange that she could be very real <laughs> right well what's 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 really um what's odd and interesting it can't not be interesting is that you know all these like narco corridos that are written about these you know glorifying these drug kingpins yeah, right uh it's just such a a weird part of the culture um, it is but um like in with the medellin cartel mm -hmm. the cartels in colombia um built schools they built hospitals they built soccer fields they built youth hostels with their money they built infrastructure for the very poor that the government had ignored right. and so there, there's kind of it's the same thing, I think, in Texas, you know, the gunslinger uh, thumbing their nose at, at the law, that yeah. somehow, you know, it, it's kind of a reversal of hero worship. Yeah. And the same thing in, in Mexico, they, they glorify, because again, the Mexican cartels, as long as you're not crossing them, um, a lot of them will give money to poor communities I in see. the barrio to, to build up the infrastructure that the government will not do. So it's kind of the Robin Hood, uh, the folk, the folk hero. Uh, but if the cartel then comes calling and says, "We need your fourteen-year-old son to be a mule," you don't say no. Yeah. No. Right. Well, it's amazing. You know, I mean, a lot of what I know about the cartels, of course, I, it's from reading Don Winslow's exactly, <laughs> wonderful, uh, exactly wonderful trilogy of books. Yes, and absolutely. 
he really, you know, emphasizes this fact that it's not the Mexican drug problem, it's the American drug problem. Because 90% of the drugs that are manufactured, 90% that are manufactured in Mexico are sold here. Right. If we didn't buy the drugs, there wouldn't be a drug problem. The way we see, I mean, there, people are always going to do drugs. Yeah. They're, they're all, we're always going to have a certain percentage of wounded, you know, the walking wounded who, for whatever reason, use drugs to escape their own personal hell. Um, but this kind of institutionalized, popularized, um, uh, you know, endeavor to, to sell drugs is on such an epic scale. And there's so much money involved that really, I mean, until people stop doing illegal drugs, which I think is partly the, the push for perhaps a, a reframing of the legal pursuit of people who do drugs, you know, class C drugs or whatever that like yeah. marijuana. Um, it, it, it's the same thing in prostitution, like in, like in Europe. If you decriminalize it, you know, then you get to control it. You can tax it, you can control it, yeah. you can keep it healthy. You keep the criminal element out of it, mostly, not always. Sure. And the same thing with drugs. And, and um, you know, but until then, we're going to be writing a lot of police procedurals about the cartels. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we could we get into the whole, but it, it, it is sad state of affairs when you see this, you know, uh, prison for profit kind of culture, yeah. especially out here in the Southwest and yep. I'm sure in Texas too. Yes. So it's just absolutely. warehousing. I mean, I'm all for you know, putting violent offenders in jail. But I mean, when you're warehousing it with these drug, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's yeah. just, it, it's kind of sad because you think, all right, well, this is a, this is a health, you know, catastrophe. And yes, absolutely. Issue. You know, this absolutely. Isn't, anyway, um, off, I'm getting off my soapbox, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, it's a complicated issue. You know I mean? It's and very police, complicated. The police have a perspective on this that, that we don't see, you know. And it brought up a really interesting point because there's an intersection here of, of mental health, uh, of uh, the exploitation of the vulnerable, either to yeah. traffic drugs or for sex trafficking. You've got, you know, a police force that's uh, under trained and over weaponized. You know, yeah. given military grade weapons. And so we, you know, we have a lot of, we, we've got a long way to go to reform a lot of this stuff. Right. For sure. Well, um, how have your books been affect, been um, received by Texans? I'd be interested to hear that. I'm sure with an awful lot of pride. And, uh, and I'd be interested to hear how female cops have responded. I mean, finally, you're giving, you're really giving them a voice. Uh, in a way that a lot of people have not. Um, well, I think it's I think it's kind of mixed um, um, because it is such a closed, insular society. The blue wall. Any, yeah, the, the 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 blue wall. I mean, um, and th and there's no question that that is a major uh, part of of the law enforcement experience. It's us and, and everybody else. Um, I think that um, Marilyn, the one that I, that I took some stories from said, you know, I, I'm really thankful that you made me so attractive. You know, you made me much more attractive <laughs> in real life. Um, I did a couple of blog series of, of super women, you know, female cops, how they have worked, um, within the system to try to rescue children from domestic violence or sex trafficking. Um, so I think um, one of the funny responses though, have been because my first three books were historical fiction and I spoke to, a, I've spoken to over 200 book clubs in the last you know, five, six, seven years. And a lot of them in Texas, Dallas has quite a few book clubs and some of them, are populated by older ladies, ladies who lunch, and they've read my historical fiction. And then I came out with the Detective Betty books, which were, you know, they're quite, they're- Scandalized you know, they're, them? 
Yeah, well, a little bit. They said, well, you seem like a nice person, but my goodness, this is really violent. So, you know, it's not when you write a book, not everybody's going to be enchanted. And I think that, you know, for some of my historical fiction readers, they they had a hard time making the adjustment, but that's okay because I have a whole new, a, a, a vast new crop of readers who love crime fiction. And I, I am so thrilled of the, the connections that I've made with other crime writers, you know, going to Bowser Khan or going to um, the Edgar Awards. I've made lifelong friendships that, that it's such really- such a supportive community, isn't oh, it? Oh, incredibly supportive. There's always, there's always exceptions, but by and large, you know, everybody's kind of like, they want, they want you to do well, you know? Um, I've, I've had incredible support uh, from the crime writing community. What's really great is that, I think traditionally the hard boiled crime uh, police procedural was kind of a male dominated because the law enforcement was mostly male, PIs were mostly male, but starting to change. I mean, the year that the, that the dime in 2017, the dime was nominated for an Edgar, three of the five authors were female. Yes. So I, I think it's, I think it's broadening its scope. I think it's um, it's it's very it it embraces writers. You know, one of my favorite writers now is Sean um, Cos uh, Cosby, yeah, who Cosby. wrote Razorblade Tears and Blacktop Wasteland. Fantastic um, writer, an incredible writer. Yeah. Um, we're finding um, you know writers of 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 all different backgrounds being more embraced and given a platform for. Um, you know, for launching their books. And I think that's great. It's about about friggin' time. <laughs> yeah, really. But, but, and I think it's only going to get- have a long way to go too. We do. Uh, yeah. We do. Because we need, you know, we need more diversity in on the publishing end and the editing end. But I think, you know- It's getting there. Slowly, slowly that's starting to happen. And um, uh, I mean, I read a really great book called Winter Counts by David Heska. I met him- uh, at a writer's conference in Colorado a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, it's such a great, it's a wonderful book. And it, sure. and it, and it's written by an indigenous person about the indigenous experience. And so right. that's really exciting to me. Yeah, it's great. And just to, to circle back to Cosby, I thought that his, uh, that the, the second one, Razorblade Tears. Yeah. was really a remarkable book. I mean, and he's, the, and some of the stuff that he's touching on, these sort of taboos are mm -hmm. just uh, amazing, mm -hmm. you know, and the way yeah. he dissects it, uh, yeah. it's really great. It, 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 his writing, his, um, his prose writing is, all, is, is close to poetry, you know, and I heard him read at Bowser a couple of years ago. He read, I think, from Blacktop Wasteland, and I thought, this guy, this guy is going to go far. He's got it. Yeah. yeah. There's so many great writers, I and mean, I like... I like uh, Ivy Pakoda a lot. I oh, yes. Very oh, yeah. Terrific writer. Terrific and, uh, writer. It's funny because I was talking to Michael Connolly um, fairly recently, and I realized that sounds a little pretentious. Yes, I was talking <laughs> to Michael Connolly over tea. He's such a nice guy, though. He's such no, a nice guy. He's a wonderful guy, but I mean, he did an event here. But he's a friend of ours for many, many years. But anyway, we we're talking about LA and sort of the state of the Los Angeles crime novel in particular. And we both were like, you know, there's this whole new generation of, um, of, of writers who are reinventing it. Yes. And a lot of them are women. And it's great to see it. You know, Ivy and Rachel Housel Hall mm -hmm. and just this whole new crop. Absolutely. So absolutely. Steph Cha. Steph Cha, absolutely. Steph Cha, uh, yeah. Your House Will Burn. I mean, yes. it's, it really is an exciting time to be a writer and a reader, I think. Right. Yeah. Uh, let me see. There is some, what time are we looking at? Um, and also for those of you watching, I am flying solo here and I forgot to do some important commercial business, which is, uh -oh. <laughs> this is the, the new book. We've been talking about the pledge and um, Kathleen is just received a shipment of books. I think some of them are ours and she's going to autograph a bunch for us. So uh, yeah. I encourage you all to get, to get in on a signed copy of the book. And if you haven't read her, you know, do you think it's necessary to start with the dime 
in your in your case? Uh, you can read the pledge as a standalone. I've heard people say that they read it without reading the dime and the burn. Right. Um, it, it is a series uh, and it kind of shows the the development of, of Betty, the growth of, of her and her career and her personal growth. But you can read it as a standalone. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, with the pledge, you know, you you give tantalizing hints of what happened in the backstory with Evangeline and and all that. Right. But uh, let me just see. So if anybody on Facebook or YouTube has any questions, um, go ahead and type them in and I'll do my best to stay on top of it. Um, I think we've just wowed them. They're all kind of just listening. <laughs> um, there were some other things I wanted to get into. Uh, about getting back to the the police kind of deep procedural details i don't know about you but i love uh i love to watch first 48 uh oh, have you yeah. ever seen that show oh i love it i and love it it's you can learn so much and there's there's right. a lot of doubt there's some dallas uh episodes where yes. you really get into the dallas pd i was thinking about that if you'd watched any of those and um you know i um Again, I am keenly aware of the fact that that there's a problem in American policing. You know, part of it is, I mean, it, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect storm of events. It's a confluence of events. It's not just one thing or another. It's, it's cultural. You have to ask what type of personality will go into, would want to go into that, you know, into the belly of the beast. So there, there's there's all of that kind of stuff. But um, I've talked to so many, again, detectives, and especially the detectives that work in Vice, that are, um, and they can usually they're rotated out of Vice after two two and a half years, because the effect that it has on these people. I mean, they really truly want to do good. And they want to rescue, and oftentimes it's females and very young females who are caught up in being trafficked. Um, and they lay awake at night. And I've had, you know, hard, hardened, tough guys cry in my presence talking about a case that went sideways and a woman that they were trying to, or a girl that they were trying to rescue ended up murdered. You know, I, 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 I do believe that um, there are people who go into it for the, for the right reasons. Um, and those are the people, the men and women that I got some of the best stories from because they, um, they felt it keenly, you know, and they wouldn't sleep until, you know, until they could get a handle on the case. Right. So there, there are good, good men and women out there trying to, of course, to do the yeah. right thing. I love this whole notion of, um, Oh, I can't remember who said it first, but uh, that the good detective um, doesn't work a case. The case works the detective. Right. I like that distinction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's I think that's good. Think yeah. That's good Let's see here. Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to circle back to uh, just for fun to Dottie. Uh, yeah. The character. She's the owner <laughs> of a slugger Ann's bar. I just jotted down a note when I was reading it, you know, that she kind of is one of those glimpses when I was talking about the outcasts, your earlier historical mm -hmm. book. She, in some ways, to me, kind of was like this glimpse of a through line to the Old West. Yeah. She represents old Texas, this old yeah. grit, you know, this kind of, uh, am, I, am I on point, you think, with that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, Betty says, you know, mentioned something about mending fences. And she says to Dottie, you know, you're probably the only person I know that's actually mended fences. That's been, she grew up in a West Texas ranch. And there is, there was a bar in New York City called Slugger Ann's that I went to several times that was, that was the most fascinating study of, of human nature you got, and, and it, women only, only women were allowed there. Um, but one of the bartenders looked like, kind of like Dottie. She was kind of, you know, ropey muscled and gray hair. And she was kind of, you know, kind of rough around the edges. And I, and I, 
and I never forgot that. And I channeled her for, for Dottie in, uh, in Sluggerans because there really was a place like that uh, in New York. And it was in the meatpacking district, which for those people who are not familiar with New York, it was downtown close to Battery Park City, way down south. And it literally used to be where all the butchers had their, you know, had their butcher shops. And then in the 70s and 80s, they all became gay bars. <laughs> the butchers moved out. They were closed down probably by the Food and Drug Administration. There were a bunch of gay, gay bars that opened up. And it was, was wild. This in the Bowery, kind of the Bowery area? Yeah, ki yeah, kind of, but it was farther south than the Bowery. Okay. Um, and it was, it was a place, um, you know, like the village, it was kind of a place for, for, for gays and lesbians to go where they would feel safe, you know, where they, where they could go and just be themselves, whatever that, whatever that meant. Um, and it was just, it was just a fun bar. So I was, I was really, I had a lot of fun sort of transplanting that in, into Dallas and, uh, I don't think there's a Slugger Ann's in Dallas. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't discovered one yet. Right. You know, it's funny, that area, and I'm going to digress, but um, have you ever read the Herbert Asbury's wonderful book, The Gangs of New York, that they made yes. into a film? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh yes. I, oh, man. Yeah. I remember, uh, what was it, about maybe 10 or 15 years ago when they were I can't remember exactly what it was. They're doing some construction on a building down there and they uncovered this facade, you know, or I can't remember exactly what the detail was, but, you know, they uncovered this glimpse into that era. Yeah. I think it was maybe a, a painting on the side of a building, but uh, that whole five points area. And right. And it's funny because I bring, I, I reference the five points in the pledge because there's a place in Dallas called Five Points, which was um, a place of a lot of, uh, you know, uh, crime, elevated crime. Yeah. And Betty, it was kind of surprised because she, because coming from New York, she remembered the Five Points, which was Hester Street and Canal. And it, it was so dangerous in the 1800s that even the police would not go there. Right because it was just, it was run by gangs, the dead rabbit gangs and the gangs in New York talk about and, some of those. Some of the, yeah. yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. Um, somebody, you have a couple of questions here. Uh, okay. Linda, who's watching, she says, um, I'm wondering if Kathleen has received any threats due to her writing. I don't know if she means from cartel <laughs> people or from cops or from anybody. Uh, no, I, I haven't. I, I'm, I'm glad to say that I have not. Um, for the first book, The Dime, though, uh, one of the, the cartel members that meets a, an unhappy end, he gets his head separated from his body, El Gitano, the gypsy, I had actually in the first draft named him after a very popular uh, and well-known cartel member. Uh -huh. And the editor said, the editor said, uh, maybe we should change that. Maybe we don't need to reference somebody who's you don't really- You want to get a call in the middle of the night. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I haven't. Yeah, you, yeah I, I have not. I mean, the, the, the police that I, that I know that have read the book have, have been, um, and, you know, of course it's fantasy. And of course they'll point out, you know, it really, it doesn't happen that way. That's not really the way. The police will do things all the time, and 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 it's true. It it is fantasy. It is fiction. And I've stretched the truth. I've tr I've tried to to maintain some integrity on police procedure, but but it it is fantasy. Well, and a lot of cops, I'm sure, will the first thing they'll say is, "Look, a lot of times we're just kind of standing around waiting for something to happen, or we're <laughs> looking on the internet, you know, researching our case." Exactly. A lot Technology. of paperwork, a lot of waiting around for sure. Yeah. yeah. Technology sure has changed the game with police work, hasn't it? Absolutely. And, that, you know, and that's why I set this. I'm such a technophobe, you know, I, I, don't, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, the most sophisticated that I got during the pledge was to talk about the stingray, which is which is a way to capture 
uh, it's a fake cell tower that captures phone calls. Um, but I, I'm just not, uh, I'm not adept. I'm not comfortable with high tech stuff. So setting, setting it back a couple of years uh, was more comfortable for me to negotiate because um, just in the last four years, there have been tremendous strides in tracking, uh, tracking people, tracking cell phones. Uh, it, it's getting really, uh, it's getting very sophisticated. Very sure quickly. is. Well, it's funny. I mentioned the first 48. My wife and I were binging on like a, a season from 2008 or 2009. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, what a difference. Um, yeah. You know, back then it's like, well, I wonder if there's a camera around, you know, and now it's like every <laughs> square foot foot of uh, right. public space is on camera all the time. Right. Right. So, yeah. yeah it's, it's changed. It's changed dramatically. Well, um, just to kind of wrap up, and it's really been a delight to talk with you, Kathleen. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. Thank um, you. Thank you so much. I was going to ask you, uh, okay, so this is marketed as the conclusion of a trilogy. Right. Um, I know you haven't kind of completely closed the door on writing about Betty in the future. At least I hope right. you haven't. Right. Um, but no. what, you, what have you got going next? What are you working on now? Um, so uh, in my earlier incarnation, I worked as a contractor to the Department of Defense in the former Soviet Union. And I started traveling there doing contract. And it was, what it, what it was, it was the US government was concerned as the Soviet Union was falling apart, that there was too much fissionable material and too much, too, too, too many pieces of weaponry kind of left floating out, out in, the, uh, in the open air, the open market. So, um, the American government started a program for contractors to go there and de-weaponize military plants. And that's, that's, that's part of what we did when we were there. Mm -hmm. And I was in Belarus and Kazakhstan. And the big concern in the early 90s was that Iran was in Belarus and Kazakhstan to acquire fissionable material and to buy uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, at the end of the cold, of the end, when the wall came down, uh, Russia alone had 7,000 nuclear warheads. I mean, just an, an unbelievably um, numerous amount of, of nuclear weapons. So the, the book that I'm working on now is based very loosely on my experiences in Belarus. And it's, um, it's, it goes into Iran trying to uh, acquire nuclear material to build the bomb. And it's based on fact, but, but there's, a lot of, there's, a, there's a lot of fiction in, thrown in there too. Wow, that yeah. sounds amazing. I'm really excited about it. I'm, a, I'm more than three quarters of the way finished and the tentative title is called The Blood of Angels. It takes place in 1990s, four years after Chernobyl, a year after the Berlin Wall comes down. And I've got, you know, the mafia trying to, to take over uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And I've thrown in a serial killer as well, just to spice things up a little bit. A little something for everybody. <laughs> a little something for everybody, exactly. exactly. What's, your, what, what's your protagonist like? Is, she a, is it a female lead? It is, well, and you know, it's really interesting because I've been inside Betty's skin for so long that the lead character in this, Melvina Don Levy, she is a clandestine CIA agent. She's young. Uh, she has a particular skill set, which is, which is real. Um, and uh, my husband actually told me about a real woman in England who's called a super recognizer. And she can, with 100% accuracy, pick someone out of a crowd or look at a photograph and then look at a, you know, a, a, a soccer game and pick out, out of thousands of people that one, that one uh, person. Like a Marvel, a Marvel superhero. Well, yeah, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of uh, super talent without the supernatural. These people really exist. They're very rare, uh, but that's what Melvina does. And she's, shown pictures of some Iranian scientists she sent to Belarus under the cover of being working for the State Department, US State Department. 
but she's really a spy and she's, uh, uh, she is tasked with finding these Iranian scientists. So she's probably a bit of a savant. She ways. is a savant. She's a little bit on the spectrum. You know, she's very different than Betty. Betty's a force of nature. Melvina's a little more, she's stealthy, uh, but she's a little bit, uh, she's a little, she's shy and retiring and uh, she has to uh, really overcome a lot of her phobias to, 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 to win out over the more, more interior kind of character. Yeah, yeah. So it's a different, a totally different path. Wow, what a great challenge. I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, Pat is watching. She said, she asks, uh, let's see, how different was it to return to Texas, question mark, um, presumably after you'd spent so many, many yeah. years in New York. Uh, any changes that surprised you? Oh gosh, it was such a, it was such a culture shock. You know, growing, I grew up as a child in Dallas. I went to school here. I went to UT at Austin. Um, and my, my dad, who was well-traveled, uh, used to tell this joke about Dallas. He would say, he would ask, what's the difference between yogurt and Dallas? And the answer was, yogurt is the one with live culture. So <laughs> Dallas was the city where cattlemen and oil men put their money, right? and then flew off to Paris or, you know, New York City or wherever. Um, but Dallas has changed so much, even when, you know, from when I moved back here in 2000, in terms of public spaces, green areas, um, it's, it's really changed. We have world-class museums, world-class art galleries. It, it has changed remarkably, but there's still kind of, a, in some quarters, there's still a bit of a, provincial way of thinking about things, kind of very insular. Um, and so that was that was the challenge in coming back to, to Dallas is that it seemed familiar in some ways and mm. yet very strange in, in other ways. Uh, New York is just, is a galaxy far, far away. Right. Um, and certain things that I took for granted, I had to kind of relearn just in terms of, the way you converse with people, you know, what's acceptable to talk about, what's not. And um, it was a, it was a re-immersion into Texas culture. Well, you know, Pat, who, uh, thanks Pat for what, for the question. And also Pat watches, uh, you know, she's a, a devoted viewer. So we really appreciate that, Pat. Oh. You'll, when you read, uh, if you haven't read any of Kathleen's books, you'll see that I think, I don't want to speak for Kathleen, but through the character, you work out a lot of that, and you get the sense that you're experiencing it with Betty, through Betty, all these changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 She well, was, she, yeah. Is that, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, she, uh, she was kind of, in a sense, an avatar for me. She would say and do things that I would not ever say or do, but she kind of, um, she was a little, the bolder, you know, the bolder version of me. A way of you maybe working out some of the stuff in your own mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, uh, thanks again uh, for spending a nice hour and 10 minutes with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, just uh, very excited for your, for your new book, publishing next Tuesday, everybody. Yes. So we will have signed copies available soon from the Poison Pen. And um, thanks so much, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Patrick, for yeah. inviting me tonight. And this was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Hope to see you again here in the Southwest. In person, hopefully. Yes. All, All right. right. Have Good a night. great night. Good Thank night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.